So uh, Sound of White Noise, yes, is another one of those records. Like, wow, I can listen to it, you know. So you, you start out like in Potter's Field. That's just a good song, man. That's just well done. The White Noise record, it always has a special place for me because it was the first one. Sure, we talked about it in interviews back then that it truly felt like we got to make our first album over again. It was like starting over. And there's songs in that record that I think are just magic. Uh, songs like Only, Room for One More, High Pro Glow, uh, Package Rebellion. These songs are songs that are kind of forgotten, but they shouldn't be forgotten because I think they are so great, you know? I was living in Huntington Beach at the time and he started coming down to my house and it worked. It wasn't like, it wasn't even something we had to talk about or think about. We just got in a room and we started working and he's like, what do you think of this after that line? Or what do you think of this verse? Or and uh, it was so organic. I did back-to-back -back records with Dave Jordan and Brian Carlstrom, you know, uh, because I did. we did Symbol of Salvation with Dave, and then Dave ended up doing White Noise. I think Dave had sometimes struggled. He thought the drums were too loud in the mix, and he, <laughs> the one joke always was that he called it like Beach Bongo Fury at one point, because, you know, Charlie's all over the... <laughs> and he said that, and I think Charlie was really probably pissed and hurt at that comment, but it was funny. But in the end, you know, the, the record's incredible. You know, it's an awesome record, everyone loves it. And as you know, I get told all the time, that's the best record. It's just, it was all fresh and new and kind of ahead of its time a little bit. And, and just really just kind of took a step, you know. I think the band was ready to take the step. You know, I, I always say that, you know, the 90s, we were embracing it and it was changing. And um, it wasn't like we were like, hey, what's Soundgarden doing? What's you know, Faith No More, Alice and what are they doing? Let's, it wasn't like we were trying to follow these bands, we were just inspired by it. And they were, they were incredible bands. When we were in those meetings with Elektra, you know, there was, there was never, there was never even, we never entertained the idea that we would change the name of the band or, or like, let's send the record out without the name on it, you know, so people don't have a uh, preconceived idea or, or a bad first impression because they think, oh, it's just gonna be some thrash metal. It's like, let them think that. That's, who cares? We don't care about that. You know, we're, we're proud of our history. We're, we're proud of, uh, you know, ourselves. We're proud of this new album. We feel like it's just as much a part of who we are as Among was. This is who we've been evolving and changing towards for years now. Because we don't sound like Nirvana in any way, shape, or form. You know what I mean? It's like, we sound like Anthrax on the album after Persistence of Time. If you listen to those records back to back, Persistence, The Sound of White Noise, to me, there's so much musical similarity in those two records. I, I could hear so much of uh, where we were going and how we got there and why, the why and how of Sound of White Noise. It's all, all the seeds were planted on Persistence. Put that record on now and say, as a fan, I'm saying this. You can say, wow, that still is. I could see that with any Anthrax record, confidently. They're just some, some really good songs, you know. Regardless, you may not have, not be a fan of every song, but on every Anthrax record, you know, you'll have a couple that say, wow, that's just good. As a fan, I'm saying that. I'm not blowing up our horn or anything. It sounds fresh and very uh, electrical and I, I don't know there's many adjectives I could use to describe it but it really has that feeling like you listen to it and it, it just sounds it's just it's just buzzing you know it really is it finally slowed down to enable me to tell my story um, throughout the song and not just the center of the song because everybody always said oh it's the mosh part and center of the center of the songs here we go it's time to mosh but have you noticed that that's the lead break in most of our songs. So it was purposely put there to slow down so that I could play leads. With Spitz, we used to give him a lot of space to basically hear, to say what you want to say here, you know? And he did, and he did it well. Slow the fucking shit down, because it doesn't have to be that fast right now. You know, we can make something that's crunchy uh, and we can get those sounds on the album finally. We have producers who could do it. So I love touring with John. I love that era with John. But that's not Fistful of Metal. That's not, the, that, it's, it evolved into um, a completely different sound. This, it was such a weird scenario 
to be in. Going into 94, we could sense that things were changing uh, in the business. On Sound of White Noise, so only was the first single on the records, and the video was doing well on MTV. And uh, it had Killer Bob from Twin Peaks in it, which was amazing. And we were crazy Twin Peaks guys. It was actually getting played on radio, like Active Rock or whatever it was called back then. First time for Anthrax that we'd had any of that, you know, outside of Headbangers Ball commercial success. Now it's time to follow up with single two. And we want something even more just, and we felt Room For One More was like, that's the song. That's the song. That was the song that was going over the, the best live People were really connecting with Room for One More. This is going into the summer of 93. What a kick-ass song that would be, you know, uh, to have out there while we're on tour and all that. And uh, Electric comes back with like, yeah, we love the song too, but we think we should go with Black Lodge. Good afternoon. At the tone, Pacific Daylight Time will be 2.48 and 30 seconds. Also, of course, Black Lodge is on that record. Angelo Badalamenti who did all the uh, composing, all the music for Twin Peaks and other David Lynch films. He co-wrote uh, Black Lodge with us. The ballad, right? Because it doesn't have jug, jug, jug guitars in it. Therefore, in some way, it's considered to be more accessible, soft, whatever stupid adjective you want to use to describe it. Even though I think it's the darkest song on the album. It's so di all the stuff Angelo did is so dissonant. And they're like, we think we should go with that. It's your biggest gun. We should go with that. And we could get Mark Pellington to direct it. Now, they've got the guy who's done like Jeremy. And he's the hottest, biggest music video director in the world in 1993. And he's agreed to do a video for Black Lodge. And we're super excited about that. But we still think. It's not the right song for the summertime. Black Lodge is not a summer vibe, out on tour playing outdoor venues song. Black Lodge is October, third single, playing indoor venues <laughs> in the fall. It just kept going like this, going like this. And of course, this wasn't over, to this is over a period of like a week, you know, that all these faxes and phone calls back and forth and, and all this about what, what the next single, because we're in a rush to get the next single and video out. I think our A&R guy actually sat down with us. He just explained to us, we really should go. We've got the label behind us. You know, we've got this song that everyone thinks is, is the song that is going to take us from being a band that goes platinum to a band that could go double or triple platinum. Do you guys love the song? Yes, of course we love the song. Well then, you know, let's use it. Let's go for it. Let's, we had never been in this position before, you know, where, we had a label that was really, really going for it and really had a plan and a vision. We went with that decision and uh, it's the worst, from a, a professional standpoint, like a create, it's the worst creative decision we ever made. Not only that, it took so long to get the video made because of Mark Pellington's schedule that we missed the whole time we were out on tour. So all the timing got fucked up. And uh, it kind of came out in a void. We were off touring somewhere else in the world. It didn't connect. Just like we thought, this is not a summer song. So by the time we came with Room for One More, like later that year, it was done. Like literally we had missed by that much. If I could ever get my hands on that Tesla time machine, I would go back to that room in 1993 and say, we're going with Room for One More. I come from the future to tell you this. You got to go with Room for One More because that's, because I don't know, I can't tell you that it's going to do any better, but it can't do any worse. Uh, you have to remember when, when that was. That was like 92, 93 for, for White Noise. And I met with uh, an artist and well, he was also a director too. I basically relinquished, like, okay, you do it. You do everything. The only thing I wanted was I, I, I didn't want to be on the cover or anything like that, but I did want a shot of the band doing what the band does all the time. That's eating, going out to a place to eat, and I wanted it to be a shot at the diner with us sitting at the counter, drinking coffee, eating, and that's the only thing I wanted for that record. Everything else you can design. And that's that's what we did. 
the first album with Bush. I'm like, oh, whoa, that's radical. I mean, drummers come and go, bass players might come and go, but to change a front person in Western music, that's a big deal. Like, you know, that's not Jello Biafra, but it's still the Dead Kennedys. Is that going to survive? I mean, that's that's intense. I thought John Bush was a great choice. I was always an Armored Saint fan. I thought, you know, I still don't think Armored Saint has gotten the respect from metalheads that they should have. I remember checking out some of that record and remarking to myself that it it's solid. Like, okay, it's different, but it's fine. I was into it. I mean, I, it, not that I wanted to see Joey go and by any means, but I was always one of the more tolerant Anthrax fans. I, I know they had people that like, you know, were so into their choice and like, man, I'm, I'm pro Joey, so I can't listen to John Bush. And, you know, I was never like that with them. Uh, you know, I've been like that with other things. I can be a fickle fan for sure. Uh, Metallica's lost me on some shit. Uh, Kiss, George Lucas. Uh, there's things that I love that I will turn on, you know, and in a, in a, on a dime if you do the the wrong thing, uh, you know, the wrong thing, whatever I think that is. Okay, so now we have okay, so John Bush is here. This is this is awesome. Um, you know, it's it, it. He added such a different sound, and I loved Armored Saint anyway. So hearing them come together made a lot of sense for me too. You can't discount. Bush's first album, Sound of White Noise, is probably one of the best metal albums of the 90s, easily. And it was it was so different and only is one of the best hard rock songs that, that was ever out there. To this day, you can put it on and sing it. To this day, you could put it up against shit that's fucking come out 10 minutes ago and it would destroy it. It sounds different. I think they're going for a different style of music. I think they're, they're saying, like, what can we do? to move forward because I think a band that stays the same is, I mean, sometimes it works and um, you know, ACDC can make it work. And then you go in the middle there and if you look at the Bush area, you've got Sound of White Noise, which I also think deserves its place in certainly maybe the top five Anthrax albums of all time. I mean, Sound of White Noise is an incredible record. I mean, John is incredible. He's, you know, undeniably an incredible singer. Um, doesn't matter how great of a singer, even if you got Paul McCartney in Anthrax, you know, you still want to hear Joey. It's like a it's like a family. You know, it's like going to see your family that lives back east in New York. And um, hey, but where's uh, Uncle Joey? Hearing the news that Joey left the band and I was sad. I mean, I think as, as any big fan of the music is, you know, I was, I was, I was sad. Well, Megadeth had a shit ton of changes too, but um, they've, they probably had more personnel change than any of us, but you know, you kept, you kept the main thing. You kept Frankie, you kept Charlie, you kept Scott. And even when he wasn't there, it's not like he wasn't coming back. The record that would come to mind usually for me was the first John Bush record, because that's when we toured with them. They took White Zombie out on that record so that's when really, you know, they would be playing every night and I would see all, if not some of their show every night. And so that's the record first comes to mind. Yeah, dude, I was already a fan of, of Bush, so I wasn't mad. And, and when I knew that he was coming in, I was like, oh, this, this is going to be good. Uh, you know, what? let's see what he can do to, to, to top what Joey just did on P.O.T. But he did. You can't, Sound of White Noise was amazing, incredible. A lot of people go, oh, you know, these kind of metal bands, they all do one thing. And and um, they all are very, very uniquely different. And the really good ones have a very specific style. And Anthrax is one of those bands. So they have a lot of those metal characteristics that we're all sort of familiar with, but they have a definite songwriting style, definite riff style, definite rhythmic style. So that stayed the same after Joy. The lineup changes are interesting. Uh, there are different periods where I like the music better. Um, I do like the John Bush era. Um, I, I love Joey's voice um, with Anthrax. So um, I think I gravitate towards those records the most, but you know, Keanu Reeves is in a John Bush era video. So there was no way I was not gonna be a fan of that. <laughs>
you know, in my anthrax is Charlie Benanti, you know, Frankie Bello, Joy Belladonna, Scott Ian, and Dan Spitz. Like, that's, you know what I mean? With, with no, no shade, no vibes to the other versions of anthrax. But those dudes are my dudes. When they came out with Cherry Coke, you know, it's like, I, I like it. I like Cherry Coke and I'm going to drink Cherry Coke, but I really like, you know, the original and you can't beat the original. So um, that's how I look at uh, Anthrax is classic Coca-Cola. But I still like Cherry Coke. Not that I don't love John Bush. I do. But I, I will always reach for a classic Coke. I like the content on those records. The reason why I don't mention them as much is because I don't like what was surrounding those records at the time. 